a time in America, alcohol and alcoholism seemed the primary worry in society. For a while, cocaine grabbed the headlines, crack cocaine too, and crystal meth, marijuana, and LSD have generated plenty of attention. But in recent years, opioids have dominated the headlines, and with good reason. More people than ever before have died of accidental overdoses, most caused by opiates. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Hazel and Betty Ford's podcast series, Let's Talk. I'm your host, William C. Moyers, and joining me today, the Chief Medical Officer of Hazel and Betty Ford, Dr. Alta Daru. Welcome, Dr. Daru. Thank you. Tell us, opioids, what impact have they had in addiction in America? So traditionally, when we think of opioids and somebody coming in for treatment for a substance use disorder, we think heroin, morphine. And so their treatment can be very predictable. With buprenorphine, naloxone, that is one of our go-to medications. But now opioid treatment is going towards fentanyl. And it's insidious. We don't know where it is. We don't know where it's going to appear, who might be using it. They know that they're using something, but they're not sure if fentanyl is in their substance that they're using. So that makes it challenging for us when we want to use a tool or a medicine like buprenorphine naloxone because fentanyl leaves the body slower mm -hmm. than other opioids. And so the treatment of it is, is tricky. It's a little unpredictable. So we've had to alter our treatment of how we would treat somebody with, with um, withdrawal and fentanyl. But let's talk about opioids in general in terms of the 12-step um, abstinence-based approach that has been our cornerstone since we began in 1949. Can we treat or can you treat opioid dependency with a 12-step abstinence-based model? Absolutely. You can treat it with an abstinence model. There are some folks that are um, very successful with not using any type of medications for opioid use disorder without using any MOUDs. It may just engage in 12-step facilitation, AA meetings, that type of thing. That can be done with the counseling support and coping skills. However, the cravings creep in and um, people may want to um, curb those cravings with the medication. There was a really nice study that was done that showed that those who don't use any type of medications for withdrawal, after about a year, um, about only 25% will still be abstinent. Mm -hmm. So we, we like to couple the 12 steps yes. with the with the recovery part, with the counseling and the coping skills, that's important. But then on the medicine side, we like to help that person in recovery with curbing those cravings. When it comes to cravings for opioids, how is that different than cravings for alcohol or other drugs? So the cravings can be the same. It's a desire to want to use it, you know, but we just have a very effective tool for those cravings with mm -hmm. buprenorphine and naloxone. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the cravings, they're the, they're, the, they're the same type of cravings, meaning wanting to use that, that drug or wanting to use that substance. When a person um, has coped all the time with that substance, that's going to be the go-to thing. So it's curbing that desire to want to revert back to those, those habits. Mm -hmm. How did opioid opioids get to be so prevalent in society? Yeah, so boy, that is a great question. So going back to the early 90s, there was the fifth vital sign. The fifth vital sign was the, everybody had to treat pain. You had to treat pain and it was enforced by Joint Commission back then. And doctors like myself at the time who were doing large open surgery cases, open abdominal cases, were taught this drug, this medicine, is not addictive. So please feel free to give your patients as much as they need. And young doctors, like I was back in, you know, mm -hmm. w when this was happening, we didn't want our patients to suffer and we wanted them to be treated with opioids and we wanted to stay compliant with what the Joint Commission expected of, of us. We found out later that these opioids were addictive and everybody has probably seen it within the, um, within tabloids and within um, media, that they were addictive. So then what you saw after 2010 was this rapid increase in opioid overdoses because now people who'd become dependent on those opioids from doctors, getting prescriptions, were now turning to the streets. And they were getting 
um, synthetic opioids. And those synthetic opioids is your fentanyl mm -hmm. so you or heroin. So even though somebody may be getting a prescription for oxycodone or oxycontin, when that was not available to them anymore, they would go into withdrawal or maybe even seeking pain. And then that's when they would turn to things like heroin, which was out on the street, and then more recently, fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So that's what contributed to the dramatic, the dramatic rise. Because in the old days, before the 90s, um, people who were dependent on opioids were typically dependent on heroin. And that came, uh, that dependency came generally in the inner cities, right? Mm -hmm. There was an association with that. The, the opioid epidemic really was driven by doctors legitimately prescribing pain meds. Right, yeah. That's yeah. ironic. What it, why don't doctors know more about that? Oh, they do. They know much more about it. And there are actually, um, there's oversight now as to how many opioids doctors can prescribe. There's databases. We get reports on how many opioids that we prescribe. Mm -hmm. And so doctor prescribing patterns are kept in check now. Okay, but medical schools um, were not doing a very good job for a long time in educating docs around addiction in general and specifically yeah. pain meds. Yeah, we're getting right? better. We're getting yes. better. And, I, yes. you know, it's the idea of opioid use disorder or substance use disorder is within medicine, but we've learned it after medical school. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do also within Hazleton Betty Ford Foundation is reach into those medical schools and invite those students into our campuses where they learn all about treatment, including 12 steps, counseling, and then they also meet with our physicians and have um, academic sessions with our physicians where they learn about the treatment of addiction because there's a board certification in addiction medicine mm -hmm. that you know, is open to them. Mm -hmm. Before you got your certification in addiction medicine, you were an OBGYN. Right. Mm -hmm. And you delivered thousands of babies yep. over your career. Yeah. Uh, tell us the, addiction and uh, pregnant women, specifically opioid addiction in pregnant women, what are the issues, what are the challenges? Probably some of the biggest challenges is the stigma associated with that. When a, a, a woman gets pregnant, she is seen as um, living up to higher standards than somebody who's not pregnant, right? So if you have a person who's pregnant, they're responsible for themselves and the baby, being this, this vessel to, to nurture their baby. And so going into treatment, they're often faced with stigma amongst healthcare providers. So there are initiatives out there to decrease stigma, and I think we're making mm -hmm. headway on that. Mm -hmm. uh, also another medication that is used for, um, for those suffering from SUD, buprenorphine, naloxone, there aren't a lot of OBG YNs like myself that um, are able to prescribe, right? So we would encourage more OBGYNs and health, women's healthcare providers to be um, get a certification to prescribe buprenorphine naloxone, life-saving medication, and safe for the mom in pregnancy. Once upon a time, we talked about crack babies. Yeah. Um, that was the 80s. That probably wasn't true, right? Right. Um, are there such things as opioid-dependent babies? So yeah, so the, the baby is a, is a passenger in the mom and they are passively hmm. dependent, right? These opioids will get to babies. There's no addiction that's assigned to babies. Baby doesn't meet the DSM-5 criteria for addiction, but the baby's gonna withdraw mm -hmm. when baby is cut off immediately from mom's opioid supply that may be coming in, and then there are gonna be withdrawal symptoms. Treatable withdrawal symptoms that babies can recover from and, and live healthy, normal lives. Mm -hmm. What about the mom who is dependent on opioids? Um, she may have had treatment, but she's still struggling. Um, she's pregnant, um, and she, goes into overdose or she has an overdose. Yeah. Whether it's a first responder or a friend or a doctor, um, Narcan is often used. Yeah. Talk about what Narcan does and is it safe in pregnant women? Right, great question. So Narcan is a medicine that is usually in the community injected up the nose. It's a nasal spray. Okay. There are other formulations of it. But if somebody in the community um, were to have an overdose, it's readily available from EMS. Anybody can give it, get it um, from the pharmacy. You don't need a prescription. You can get it over the counter from the pharmacy in, in our states. And so um, when you're giving this life-saving um, medication up the nose like a nasal spray, there's nobody that can't get it, right? There are, there are no contraindications mm -hmm. that we know of it. Mm -hmm. 
And the alternative is that person's going to die. <laughs> if you don't give it, that person's going to die, you know, anyway. So we want to be proactive to give it to everybody, including pregnant women. There's a lot of hesitation to give the medications to pregnant women. What will I do? Will I hurt the baby? Will I hurt the mom? Well, if you think a couple steps forward, if you don't treat that mom and she's not breathing, that's going to compromise baby. If she becomes anoxic or not getting enough oxygen and that baby's not going to get enough oxygen, they may both die. So you're not going to hurt mom or baby by giving Narcan. So please give it to that pregnant person if you find her as an overdose. Just because mm -hmm. she's pregnant is not a contraindication to it. You'll be saving two lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the treatment, go back to the treatment for a second. Um, I remember when Hazel and Betty Ford, or Hazel at the time before we merged with the Betty Ford Center, about a decade or so ago, we began to introduce um, medication into our treatment regimen for opioid dependent uh, patients. And there was a lot of blowback from the recovery community around that. People even saying that uh, those uh, using medication were not sober right. or not recovering. What's your response? So to I've that? heard that. I've heard that. And I've been in those rooms. Mm. I've heard that. And I've heard people talk about that, right? And, and that's just change. That's people who were taught recovery by apprenticeship. And this is what I've done. And this is how I'm going to help you. And you should try it my way. And, you know, this is what worked for me. And a lot of this 12 step with a sponsor and AA is this apprenticeship model, but then in comes science and medicine, mm -hmm. and we can use that too. And that just augments the treatment. Because somebody's getting a medication like buprenorphine naloxone, that just helps them with their cravings. There may be this misperception that a person is using, or they may be getting some type of euphoria yes, or yes. high, and they don't. Yes, yes. Something like buprenorphine naloxone is also, it only acts on the par, on the receptors partially. It's called a partial agonist. Mm -hmm. So a person is not going to get high from this. They're not going to get euphoric. And so this just may be a misunderstanding in the recovery community about what buprenorphine naloxone oh, is. Okay. But we highly encourage our patients to be in those rooms of yes. AA and yes. NA. And if you want to keep it private, keep it private. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I definitely have heard those things. And I think it's because of a not much education or a misunderstanding about how the medication yeah. works. And I think there is an easing of that uh, resistance, if you will, uh, as, as we continue um, to see people finding recovery even while using medication. Let's talk a little bit about treatment in the five minutes that we have left. Do you have to um, go to treatment uh, for opioid dependence to, to get well? No, you don't. There are many people who some just stop on their own. Some don't need anything. We see this with alcohol. We see this with opioids. People have a really good family structure and can white knuckle it and not have to go to treatment. But then for those that can't do that, you can go to your primary care physician. You can talk to them about buprenorphine naloxone. You can get the counseling. So you can do that on an outpatient you know, basis. Mm -hmm. Any physician who chooses to get the training can prescribe buprenorphine naloxone. It does not have to be an addiction medicine physician. Mm -hmm. And what about people who are using medication to uh, uh, support their recoveries? As a rule, should they stay on that medication or should they come off of it? A great question that a lot of the other community has too. Yes. So the ACM guidelines, the American Society of Amer uh, Addiction Medicine, says, and we agree at Hazleton Betty Ford, that you should stay on this medication for as long as you're providing benefits, right? As long as you're getting benefits from these medication and it's helping you, then stay on the medication. There may be, there may be a time though, when the patient says, you know, I've got the coping skills that I need. I have the sober, sober community. I have the family support. I think I can start to, to ease off this medication. There are some patients like that and we would support them. We also support the patients that just aren't there yet, and mm -hmm. they feel like they're benefiting from this medication and may not be ready to come off. Mm -hmm. What about the role that virtual treatment pay, plays? You and I are here in the summer of 2022. We're on the backside of the pandemic, um, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, but virtual does seem to be here to stay in society, and that includes addiction treatment. How does it work for people who are dependent on opioids? Yeah, so the... Virtual is very good. It was the gift of, of COVID. It allows us a way to get a person into treatment. Mm. We can talk to them about the medicines available. There are certain things that we can do to work with urine drug screens to provide that person support. The thing that may be missing though in the virtual component is the intimacy and the social intimacy and the feeling of community and that connection 
that was lost in COVID that we really need in recovery. Mm -hmm. So virtual is great, but it would love, it, it would be great. I'd love to see it combined with some type of uh, group or you know social community mm -hmm. on the other end of that camera. And can uh, patients who are in uh, virtual treatment, can they still be prescribed the medication if they need it? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Okay. There are guidelines around that, but yes, they can be prescribed that, that medication. We're about out of time, I um, mean, I have uh, a one or two more questions to ask you, but there is oftentimes a perception that, uh, particularly in the old days when people were um, addicted to heroin, um, that they never got better, um, or that their, their level of getting better was less than what it should be. Would you just put us all straight once and for all that it is possible to recover oh, from yeah. the opioid dependence? Absolutely, recovery is possible. I've seen many of our patients, success stories, people that come back and talk, alumni that come back and talk to mm -hmm. our people in recovery on, in groups and, and share their story. Oh, I've seen many, many, many recovery stories, you know, especially with the counseling, how robust that is and medications to help. So yeah, there's plenty of help and success out there from opioid use disorder. And we're glad that you're leading um, our organization in, in, in the charge in terms of uh, treatment and in terms of uh, advocacy, advocating for um, recovery. Let me ask you, you're relatively new still as the chief medical officer. What's been the biggest aha for you since you took on this role as chief medical officer of Hazel and Betty Ford? Yeah. The big aha has been how many, seeing how many patient, patients we've touched, uh -huh. how many patients we've touched, and then their family, hearing their family stories, the family stories of gratitude, this is how well my person is, or the family involvement where they say, my loved one needs a little help, can we get them back into treatment, is there any more that you can give us? I've just been astounded at the thousands of people, I can't say millions because I don't really know the number, <laughs> of lives that we've touched. Yes just after our initial treatment, because those people go, they pass it, they pay it forward, uh -huh. they pass it on. So it's amazing how many people we've touched. Yes, well, Dr. Alta Drew, thank you so much for um, being with us today and touching uh, us uh, here in studio and with our viewers across the um, audience at uh, our Let's Talk podcast. We're glad that you're in the position that you are and we're so grateful for your advocacy. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this vital conversation about opioids treatment and recovery. We hope you'll tune in again to learn more about substance use disorders, treatment and recovery issues. Remember, treatment works and recovery is possible. We'll see you again.